Hi, I'm Valentina, a first year PhD student in our Italian section, and here we are today for presenting a book, Maneable Anatomies, written by Lucia da Come. She is a teacher in University of Toronto, and she focused on cultural history of 18th century medicine, and now we will present her work, so thank you for coming. Well, thanks for having and me here. I think that one of the first questions that I want to ask you is how uh, and when you become interested in the topic are you writing about and how your research developed in the course of last years. Thank you, thanks. Um, so I came across these objects a bit by chance and I was struck by the visual power. Um, I found them sort of that they were very strongly um, they had they were somehow mysterious and intriguing and they resonated with things that I was interested in and sort of um, I was thinking about and sort of one of them was um, what's the role of objects in history and uh, how did um, objects um, participate in creating knowledge um, another aspect, because these objects uh, were representations of bodies and anatomies, and so I was interested in the way in which they actually point, offered a specific point of entry into a way of representing the body, of thinking about the body. And uh, beyond the object, I was interested in the labor that, was, uh, that went into them, so I was interested in artisans, and hands-on practices, mm -hmm. and uh, in a related matter, manner, um, in the presence of women in in the history of mm -hmm. medicine. Okay. So, so seeing these objects somehow was a bit of a um, a special encounter. So, what I was wondering what is behind mm -hmm. um, this strong visual power that um, they actually c that characterizes them. And um, how would the history of medicine look like if we start writing a story about them? And sort of what, um, how do they give access to a world that hasn't left behind a big, a voluminous paper trail, but um, sort of would um, allow us to find out about uh, historical actors that haven't left behind books, yeah. for instance, and they have been uh, forgotten by history. Yeah. And in the book you mention a lot of material that are both writing material mm -hmm. and like model made of wax mm -hmm. or wood. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you tell about the difference of working with text or mm, stuff, like material stuff and material culture? Yeah, that, that was a bit of a challenge because um, I had worked with um, written text before mm -hmm. and um, so thinking about visual uh, material and, and sort of an object um, presuppose rethinking about sort of what is the nature of sources mm -hmm. and what is the nature of historical evidence. So So I sort of started to to look at what people had done with the history of the book and the history of readerships in terms of thinking about intertextuality and whether that model could be translated into intervisuality mm -hmm. somehow yeah. or intermateriality mm -hmm. and how these different levels uh, spoke to each other. Mm -hmm. so, so there were specific challenges in, in thinking about material that is written and material that is not written. Mm -hmm. and what kind of language visual material um, would, would elaborate and sort of what's, how can we approach that as historians? Mm -hmm. So how does that speak to the way in which knowledge has been created historically? Mm. So do you work a lot in archives? Or? Yes, th this project presupposed a lot of work mm. in archives and um, it's uh, so there's uh, there was a conceptual part mm -hmm. and sort of that was related to my interest in seeing how these objects uh, emerge mm -hmm. sort of historically as objects mm -hmm. of knowledge and i was interested in the um, complex network of social relations that developed around them 
So, so that presupposed on one level some sort of a conceptual infrastructure, mm -hmm. but at another level, sort of a lot of empirical work in mm -hmm. archives. And uh, so, so the challenge there was to bring together these different levels. Mm -hmm. So the uh, follow the chronological development and at the same time um, keeping in mind their overarching story while making sure that the conceptual infrastructure would be mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. And personally, I did few works in archives, but mm -hmm. I know that every time it's a kind of adventure, mainly <laughs> in Italy. So yeah. if you want to like tell us one of the fun or at least mm -hmm. strange experience that you have during your research. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, there, there, there were a lot of <laughs> interesting yeah. experiences. One memory that I have that was uh, quite interesting was that um, working in s sometimes in small archives mm -hmm. that wouldn't be necessarily organized mm -hmm. to have readers. So there was this archive of um, marriage, it's called the Monte del Matrimonio, mm -hmm. where um, young women would um, sort of have deposits um, over their life for, for accumulating a dowry mm -hmm. by the time they would get married. And that was one of my characters, Anna Morandi, one mm -hmm. of the modelers, were the main character of the yeah. story, um, actually had a deposit in, in this archive. So, so I wanted to trace, also to understand sort of what had happened, what were her status. And um, so, so I visited this archive, which um, basically ha had no readers or had, had no readers. And at the time I was visiting, it was uh, being refurbished mm -hmm. and reorganized. And so I was literally amidst piles of documents. I was the only person there with the archivist in this beautiful mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of palace and uh, sort of really piles of documents, but still with the help of, of the archivist, I managed to find <laughs> things which I thought, um, sort of data documents, uh, which I found uh, I was very happy about. I thought yeah. it would be impossible. Or uh, another sort of, um, somehow another memory brings me to, um, to actually following the objects. I was very interested in reconstructing the the world of wax mm -hmm. that developed, that was present and developed in parallel and sort of um, alongside these anatomical uh, wax works. So, so what this took me to the world of devotion because there were a lot of um, object, devotional objects mm -hmm. that were made in wax. And so the, I remember particularly um, visiting a monastery where I was shown um, the wax mask of a woman who had died in mm -hmm. honor of sanctity in the 18th century and asking to take a picture. And then I was told, well, no, you cannot take a picture because we are um, go about to start the trial. Oh. And at the time, I couldn't quite understand what was the trial, <laughs> but it turned out to be the canonization process. And so, mm -hmm. so quite interestingly, at that time, I had not started yet to think about anatomy and sanctity and canonization. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought that, um, was was quite um, interesting because without knowing I had hit one of the important aspects of the story. Yeah, and this brings me to another question because in the, in the last part of your book you mentioned mm -hmm. how much is important to reference to reality mm -hmm. to modelist in 18th century mm -hmm. and it came to my mind like how much are mm, important and promote show exhibition nowadays like real body mm -hmm. and what do you think about the relation between this new kind of exposition mm -hmm. that like put a very strong accent in reality mm -hmm. and the um, like exposition of body and the success that they had in compared to the modelization of body in 18th century if you have some thoughts about this Right, so um, claims to realism in, in the history of anatomy, mm -hmm. but one could sort of maybe generalize that. So to always happen within given conventions, mm -hmm. right? And so, so they, um, that we can trace a shifting sort of um, uh, history of, of those claims. And um, 
in uh, and they're quite often related to a, a specific relationship between what is shown and what is concealed because mm -hmm. in 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 the material look at that what you see and what you don't see is quite important in defining yeah. how something can be um, looked at as as uh, lifelike or not in the history of anatomy there were two ways mainly to in the early modern period to look at but not only in the early modern period but to think about how to represent bodies mm -hmm. one would be thinking about portraying a specific specimen and another one would think of, would look at um, reconstructing some a bodily part for instance in light of a process that is reconstructing the memory and the imagination so so that tells us that there is an aspiration towards universality but is actually always locally mm -hmm. produced and locally constructed now with regard to current days claims about mm -hmm. real bodies so that's a big um, it's a big story mm -hmm. and so the people have, have written about that and um, um, one interesting aspect uh, is that there are the claims here to reality are associated with the fact that we are using real bodies, mm -hmm. real cadavers, um, but at the same time this body quite often are presented with postures that draw from that early modern repertoire of images so so i find quite interesting that um the realism so-called realism yeah. of this body is still filtered by these forms yeah. that were um, idealized mm -hmm. and canonic forms so so i think that um there's something quite interesting uh, there yes, uh, yeah. Relation, yes. yeah it certainly speaks uh, it's a big phenomenon that speaks yeah. to of our obsessions with the fear of decay and yeah. the passing of time and our perception of yeah. bodies and time. Okay, yeah. thanks. And another thing that I really like in your book is the present of photograph. Uh, mm -hmm. About what are you talking about? And I know that selection could, I mean, it's a part of your work and mm -hmm. material. How do you select which images were better than other? Yeah. And what is difficult or yeah so so yeah it's always difficult to select images <laughs> <laughs> i had a, a large uh, number of images um so in the end i tried to select the images that were integral to the narrative because mm -hmm. i really wanted the images not to be there to illustrate but to be an integral part mm -hmm. of the story and uh, and so so um i I focus on the model that were discussed in the book mm -hmm. and so and I conceive the images to be an essential part of the book. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's still not extremely easy to include many uh, images mm -hmm. in books and so I had to decide which ones would have to be in color and which ones would have to be in black and white and the decision there was that obviously models and objects that were colored uh, in, in three-dimensional had to be in color yes. and so and images that were already in black and white and and sort of were taken from a textual source um, mm -hmm. could be uh, in, remain in black and white yes. so that's you mentioned you bring up many many different character in the story and one thing that you really like that in every chapter you bring a lot of information, never like ending, like never concluding an argument, but trying to uh, relating things and s different side. And my question is like, when and how the structure of the book rise? Like if you already have material for article and you bound them together or, or not, if the structure starts before the process of writing. Um, so, so your, your question actually um, uh, points at something that um, has been uh, was in my mind throughout the process and um, I, I was interested in following closely the social lives of these objects so, so there was a challenge there between sort of following the chronology and the detail and sort of what we mentioned earlier the overarching story mm -hmm. and the conceptual infrastructure so I was very concerned with um, trying to make sure that the reader 
would sort of could follow the development, but at the same time uh, see that all the aspects uh, were interconnected and so could appreciate somehow how there was um, a network of internal yeah. um, um, relations. So, so I decided to go for a method that was a little bit about um, like um, creating textile. Mm -hmm. So embroidering, knitting, okay. and so so I would focus on 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 the specific step and thinking about how this would take me to one pattern and then to potentially the following pattern, but having in mind the overall picture, and so there could be the possibility of moving from the picture to to the detail and to the intermediate as it were patterns. So so. That was a challenge that um, I had more or less the architecture mm -hmm. in mind from the beginning, but um, the process required a lot of rewriting. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that you asked me this question makes me helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me.